It was known as the world's most secure prison, The Rock. Sitting in the San Francisco Bay surrounded by the freezing currents of the Pacific Ocean, it was a fortress from which there was no escape. But on June 12, 1962, four men hatched a plan to do just that. Today, we explore the compelling story of the escape from Alcatraz. This is Red Web. Welcome back to another Mystery Monday Task Force. I'm your host, Trevor Collins, and with me as always, Alfredo Diaz. Dude, you're talking my hometown. You're talking The Rock. We're talking about SF, and not Dwayne Ooh, The Rock Johnson. No. Though he about, would probably also be inescapable. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, we're you know. talking about <laughs> a very famous prison on a little yes. island in the Bay Area. And this, what year was this? This was in 1962. 1962. So in the heyday of yeah. Alcatraz. I mean, no, I start, I study a lot about Alcatraz because, like, like 20 years later, there was um, former General Francis Hummel who took a bunch of hostages on the rock and then threatened to actually induce like chemical warfare upon like U.S. soil. Whoa. And then that's when they had Stanley Goodspeed, who was a biochemical engineer. Wait, what? <laughs> And no, John, this is serious and, Christian, and, and, right, right. yeah, and then oh. and John Mason, they, yeah, uh, who yeah, was yeah. a former inmate, and they had them come and like <laughs> that was the numbers guy, right? Like yeah. he was the accountant. Yeah, he's like why the numbers. You, the Christian, numbers why are you laughing? Like, no, I'm surprised you remember that uh, compelling piece of history. Yeah, yeah. it was <laughs> like I mean, obviously because I lived in the Bay Area, right, so right. It was, he's got to know Christian. It, it was taught. It was taught in the schools. Right, yeah. right. And what was the what was the drill? When this was going down, you know, they'd say yellow alert, you know, and you got to what the were the rules? Uh, well, it was, it was mostly just duck and cover. There was really much like we didn't find out later on until like, you know, if the chemical dispersed into the air, there was nothing we could really do. I got to ask the question. John Mason and Stanley Goodspeed stopped uh, General this, Francis Hummel. Yeah. National the, heroes. Yeah. This is a movie or are we talking books. about black ops from Con <laughs> Call of Duty? Which which of these I don't I don't know these names. Fame, well famed enough. historian uh, Michael Bay did a, a story oh, on the yeah. matter. Yeah, <laughs> it's the nice. movie The Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew think, it was something. I knew I it was think, something, but I was like, no, 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 Christian, let them. I let think this I run. had him for like a you, second. Oh, you did. I think the I first, had him for a second. The, the first, Christian just went off. The Sorry. first uh huh was real, and then after that, I was like, okay, no, 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 this is. This is something, but I'm going to let it run. Dude, The Rock's one of my favorite movies ever. That's why I was like, oh, yeah, General Francis Hummel. Yeah. Like. Well, you know, that's what we do here on Rooster Teeth's number one movie podcast, podcast. about mysteries. You said but, the name, and I was like, what? that sounds familiar. And then you right. more to like, he took him hostage. And I went, oh, my God. When you, said, <laughs> when you said good speak, I was like, no, hold on a second. Hold yeah, Stanley good speak. Then I, then I heard Mason. Then I started going, oh, is this Call of Duty Black Ops? Like, what's happening here? <laughs> R.I.P. Sean Connery. But yeah, so this is a pretty infamous case. I'm sure a lot of people know about it, but there's a lot of details that, you know, that's what we're here for. Yeah. We're going to uncover all those filthy, dirty details. But we're going to walk through this in a, in a particular order. A lot of people dive right into the strategizing, the plan, and how it all went together. We're going to walk through exactly what went down that night from yeah. the guard's perspective, go into the investigation, kind of as a normal person mm -hmm. literally in the 60s would have lived this, and then kind of looking back on history, go through how everything actually shook out. Because right. there is a fourth individual that is a part of this three-person party oh, that we wow. will kind of talk about. And that's how we got all these extra informational yeah. pieces. Well, The Rock was supposed to be inescapable. Yes. Yeah. The Alcatraz uh, prison was said to be completely inescapable. And it was because th it used to be a fort. It used to be a fort because right. SF was definitely a military uh, base. I mean, mm -hmm. you can still see a lot of those bunkers to this day. Oh, well, yeah. We have like Fort Mason mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. There's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so that was then remodeled into this prison. And then uh, obviously the very, very cold waters that would get into the, like maybe the 40s. And the tides. We're talking about like Fahrenheit. Like and, uh, you know, two miles off the closest coast. Right. Sometimes it's it's been said that great whites have been seen in the bay. Yep. Uh, that they at least they don't live there, but they come pass Re, through. Yeah, they come pass through. So there's a lot of reasons why this this place is inescapable. Right. Like good luck swimming two miles Oof. against like a current and freezing cold temperatures. Yep. Like whew, not many Absolutely. people would be able to make that. Absolutely not. Yeah. In fact, and we're not going to go into all the stories, but I think it's said about 50 some odd people over the course of Alcatraz's history have tried to escape. Many of them failed. Many of them also had passed away in trying to do so. 
So these three that we're talking about here today in particular are the standout case just due to the very nature of not knowing how it went. Did they make it? Right. Did they not make it? And if they didn't, how'd that go down? All of the questions we will talk about. Okay. But uh, let's dive into it. Let me wind your mind back Mm -hmm. to June 12th of 1962. The guards of Alcatraz were going about their normal routine in the morning checking beds. And when they checked in on these three particular convicts, they found that after prodding them several times, they weren't waking up. And then they poked one of them in the head with their stick, reaching through the bars. Off tumbles this fake head as it hits the floor. These three convicts were John Anglin and his brother Clarence, as well as Frank Morris. So talking about Frank Morris, back in January of 1960 is when he arrived at Alcatraz after being convicted of bank robbery, burglary, and repeated attempts to escape various prisons and various other crimes as well. In fact, he had previously broken out of a Louisiana prison where he had been serving time for a bank robbery and was then subsequently sent to Alcatraz because of this history of trying to break out. Uh, Man, first off, I wouldn't do anything that would send me to prison. Are you going to be like, I'm looking for the best behavior early out sort of situation? I like, like I hello, wouldn't just guard, me nice as a civilian. I'm, I'm always active. It's like, I never want to do anything that's going to like get my ass. Sent oh, to prison. okay. So your rules before punishment. Right. Got it. But if I was to be sent to prison, uh-huh. I wouldn't even know where to begin to try and break out. Let's dive into How it. do you break out of a prison? That is a very good question. Like looking back into the past and thinking about it, you think, it's fanciful because you've seen it in movies and you're like, right. that, that's too good to be reality. But we'll dive into how they did it at Alcatraz. But I'm the same. I, I'm in this I, very same boat. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? I guess I would try to see the timing of the guards and the shifts and yeah. then where the cameras are and then see like what times do I kind of have to myself and where bolting for a fence. <laughs> so I don't like what yeah. under. I have no idea how you just go like, I'm just going to escape this fortress that's built to contain me. Right. And then then also, like, I'm kind of glad that the whole, like, making a little dummy body in your bed is something that actually happens. Oh, yeah. Because I always see that in the movies and I go, come on. Come on. But it actually happened. There is a lot going on with this escape. And for any of the things that are uh, visual, as always, we're going to post photos of those at Red Web Pod. Or you can check us out and watch this on YouTube at Red Web Pod on there as well, and we will provide those visuals. But yeah, I mean, maybe I'm in the camp where I end up overthinking it, not having been in a prison. Right. So I think, you know, very Jack Sparrow marooned on an island, like, let me harvest my back hair and round up a couple sea turtles. You know, like, that's where my <laughs> mind starts going. I start thinking, like, oh, maybe if the moon phase is just so, like, maybe I'm just overcooking it, you know? I think, yeah, I mean, I think you need to overcook it, though. Maybe right? maybe it's best to just underthink it. Maybe think maybe you just think like just what, these guards are just regular run folk. Run for it. They're, you know they've got faults. They got blind spots. Oh, I think a thousand percent. They yeah. might be able to be bribed even. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, come on. There's got to be corrupt prison out there. Absolutely. Some people that are higher up in the crime industry have a little bit of it uh, easier behind bars. That's just what Christian was yeah. telling me. Yeah. I just Christian. <laughs> Christian, you've been in the you've been in the clink. Look, we don't need to dive into my history on today's episode. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's just, he I just says, you. suffice to say, we got an inside guy. Right. Okay? <laughs> All I right. told you, we got to be better about vetting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did. That's what I liked about him. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into the other two that we're going to talk about. Because again, there is a fourth. I'm not ignoring right. them, but let's dive into the other two. So later that year, a man named John Anglin was also sent to Alcatraz, along with his brother Clarence, who then joined uh, later there in early 1961. So very briefly, I'll kind of talk about these folks. So January 17th, 1958, John and Clarence Anglin, along with their older brother, Alfred, all robbed Alabama's Bank of Columbia. They used plastic firearms in order to escape with over $18,000 in cash. Eventually, they were all caught and arrested five days later in Ohio. They all three went to prison. John and Clarence ended up going to prison in Kansas, where Clarence attempted to escape by smuggling himself out in two enormous boxes. Both had also tried to run from chain gangs. And in 1960, eventually all these things collided to make prison officials essentially say, okay, we're going to send these two brothers in particular over to Alcatraz where they will not be able to realize their dreams of escape. Yeah. And then Alfred will be a tertiary brother out in, you know, the wild of of the prison lands. So that's where we get the three. That's how they all arrived at Alcatraz. And cutting to the chase, I mean, 
They all three previously knew each other from shared imprisonment at the Atlanta Penitentiary. Uh, and of course, the two were brothers, so they knew right. each other. And again, jumping to the case, the three were placed in adjacent cells in Alcatraz, which gave them the easy Why? ability to talk and discuss and plan. What? What? I feel like that'd be silly. Yeah. Yeah. Because not only hubris, it's, it's like, okay, you have a bunch of people that you're going to make comfortable because they're sitting next to their, you know, jailmates, whatever. Right. Uh, they could they could plan for like brawls or, you know, prison fights, et cetera. But these are people right. who have actively tried to escape from a prison. You're putting them next to each other. What do you I think? I would imagine not that everybody at Alcatraz has some sort of history because they're all there. Yeah. So I think the two brothers being next to each other is a bit egregious. That's where I start to go, okay, that is silly. Because they definitely right. know each other. I feel like I just, especially if it's like people that have tried to escape, yeah. right, and they know each other, mm -hmm. don't put them next to each other. Right. I feel like it's just kind of like, you know what? I'm going to be safe. Who knows? Just in right. case, like, sure, you can't stop them. If they have yard time, outside time, they're going to talk. But if they're literally next to each other, they can just whisper to each other all night. Pass Absolutely. things back and forth to each Absolutely. other, maybe. I don't know, depending on how their cells are and stuff like that. But, like, it just... I don't know. As a precaution, I would have done that. Also, eighteen grand, man, inflation. Yeah, yeah. Back I don't then, know what that they would were be now, like, but Woo -wee! yeah, eighteen grand today is like, all right, that only gets you so far. But here's the thing: let's let's wind it back on their cells because a lot of people like to say that they were placed together, and they were. But there's a lot of other nuance within that. I'm not sure how their cells were when they first got there, but I do know that, and we'll get into the planning and and all the plot development. But jumping to that kind of point. They knew after kind of knowing this prison a little bit that there was a, a grate on the roof, a, a shaft that went up to the roof that had a weak spot. And again, cutting to the chase, they knew that. And so they all individually put in a petition or a form to have a cell swap. And all of their asks to move to a different cell were permitted. They were granted. So that's where it really becomes egregious because not Whoa. only did they just blindly put them all together, they, they were put into the prison, and eventually they were like, we all want to go to cell block B, essentially. Why? And they're like, cool, got it. And then they approved it, and off they went. And so now they're all together. That is... So wait, they were all together, then they moved together. So they weren't all together. Oh, okay. That's where I get a little hairy on my knowledge there, I admit. Right. But a lot of... That's what I'm trying to say, is a lot of people just gloss over how they kind of came to be at in the same cell blocks near each other. But it's because they petitioned to have their cells moved and to have to be swapped out. And, th and they were approved. That's even more insane. I think hubris <laughs> is going to be the main lesson here. Right. When, when you have a prison just... whose reputation is inescapability, yeah. the guards might let their guard down. I would think so. Yeah. Like if I was a guard in a prison and it was like super high tech and, uh, you know, cameras automated this and that and... Um, stay, stay the art, like technology, and you know, I'd probably let my guard down a bit. I'm like, yeah. hey, you know, tech, uh, tech's got this figured out. But, right. You know, it's very easy to hack stuff. Oh yeah, and you really, I mean, another lesson here that we're gonna start diving into even further is trusting your inmates. There, there, there seems to be a trend that we're gonna get even more into where they're trusting inmates who have a history of trying to escape. You shouldn't be giving autonomy to prison Damn. mates. But let's get back to the case. So Morris led John and Clarence in plotting their escape, or that's what people tend to believe, because he was coined as the intellect. He's the one who had the highest IQ of the group. In fact, it is said his IQ was as high as 135. Whoa. So he is uh, is pretty smart. Okay, so that makes me feel better about going into, if I was to go to prison mm -hmm. and being like, how do I even start? This guy has, has a super high IQ. Right. So his his, his beautiful Brainiac. mind's already working at it. Right. So when the guards eventually came to check their beds in the morning, they were met instead by paper mache dummies covered in flesh-colored paint and real human hair. So when they walked by at a glance, it looked truly like them, but it was just their head with pillow stuffed into like the bed, the covers pulled their up. hair or something? Ooh, we'll get into all that. They, like, where the hell they get the paint? We're going like, to get into how they got the paint, how what? they made these heads, the where the okay. hair came from, where, where they physically went. Okay. Oh my God, this is such a MacGyver sort this, of situation, oh. and I love it. Oh man, we just aged ourselves. Oh yeah. Well, I didn't. I never watched the show, but I've heard of it. Oh, I watched it. <laughs> it so the show. prisoners essentially used toilet paper, cement, cardboard, toothpaste, and hair trimmings, of course, 
from the other prisoners found at the barbershop in order to make these heads. And of course, the prison immediately went into lockdown to search for these three dangerously skilled prisoners. And this search was in full force. So let's talk about the investigation, what they found. Again, we're walking through this as people living it at the time, and then we'll walk back and get all those juicy details. So after this lockdown, the FBI was immediately contacted, and they accessed nationwide records on the missing prisoners and their pretty large history of previous escape attempts. All three of them had previous escape attempts, as we kind of outlined, so they looked into that. Furthermore, the FBI interviewed the various families of the missing inmates to compile their identification records. Boat operators in the bay were asked to be on a lookout for debris or signs of their escape. Here's what the men look like. Here's what they might have on them, etc. Let us know what you see. Now, with that said, a few interesting pieces of evidence were in fact found across the bay over the subsequent days and weeks of this escape attempt. For example, there was a packet of letters sealed in rubber and it did relate to the men. There was also a paddle-like piece of wood and rubber inner tubes that were kind of in tatters. They were mm -hmm. in scraps. These, I think the paddle was found near Angel Island, which is nearby, okay. and the rubber tube-like scraps were found near the bridge. There was also a homemade life vest that was found washed up on Cronkite Beach, something to keep them afloat. And they could tell because a lot of these materials seemed to originate back from the prison. So these various pieces essentially said, okay, no, they did make it out and at least into the water. So this inspired a much more extensive search, but unfortunately, no other pieces were ever found. In fact, I do want to say, uh, I'm going off my memory here. Uh, the letters that were found, I believe also with either within that same rubber envelope or in a separate piece of rubber, there was a wallet found, which had family matters. I think some photos or other documentation related to the family. So again, to confirm that it was these three men, that was something else that was found. So officials hoped that the England's other incarcerated brother, Alfred, who we talked about, who was again housed in an Alabama facility, hopefully, you know, he would supply some answers. Hey, you know your brothers better than anyone. Right. Maybe what's on their mind? What would they be doing? Where could they be going? All that sort of stuff. But to their dismay, Alfred was supposedly electrocuted during an escape that he had attempted previously and so he took as little or as much information as he, as he might have had on his brothers to the grave. Whoa. Yeah. S Wait. So they went to go interview him so and, the, and they're like, like, yeah, he tried to escape. And so unfortunately, like, was the fence electrified away? or did they just, I don't know, beat him with stun batons or something like that? That's, that's a good question. Christian, do you know how Alfred might have uh, been electrocuted during his escape? Was it? digging through the wall or i will double check because i'm not entirely sure on the details okay man i almost feel like maybe they were just hiding and then they just threw out like evidence, oh, little pieces little pieces or something but then i don't know i mean alcatraz is big enough and it has different like uh facility like sections of facilities like underground that there could be areas you could hide out on but then that seems kind of risky and also you know one of them is smart enough to probably try and think of like all right, try and time out high tide and all that kind of stuff to make their swim mm -hmm. and their journey easier. But I don't know, like that's such a difficult thing to pull off. Like now you're not only trying to break away from a prison, you're trying to swim to like the shore, get off of this island. And then on the flip side, like I'm sure they hunted them down and threw every resource at it, like you said, because, uh, you know, they marketed it as like this, in, you know, this unescapable prison, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> it's bad not unescapable. Bad press if you right? lose three guys. If you lose three guys, oh, then yeah. all of a sudden it's like, well, Alcatraz can be broken out of. Yep. And that's maybe you be just plastered everywhere. You shouldn't label things with ultimatums. I mean, we got True. the unsinkable Titanic. We've yep. got the inescapable Alcatraz. And Ooh. you know, who knows? Yeah. It's it's interesting thoughts because like right now, you know, the plan is hard to kind of conceive of with just some of the things they had. Like for example, the ore that they made was just scraps of wood with some screws put together. Here, I'll show you some quick photos of what that looked like. That's what they found. Oh, wow. They have photos. That's really cool. Yeah. So that was just floating off the coast there of nearby Angel Island. But of course, all the authorities, I mean, the Bureau of Prison Authorities, the FBI, Alcatraz Guards, the Coast Guard, 
Everybody at this point is invested in figuring out what's going on here and finding these men. And so they started looking inward. They started looking towards the inmates to see, does anybody in here know what that plan might have been? And this is where Alan West comes into the story, the fourth man with this group. West was another prisoner at Alcatraz that the three had met previously while incarcerated back in Atlanta. So West, Alan West, had been a part of this whole strategizing. He had helped devise the plan as long as he could also be included within the plan to escape with the three. Whoa, okay, so now we have someone that has knowledge. Oh, on the inside. On the inside, yeah. but then possibly got ditched? Possibly got ditched, well, here's what happened. So the night of the escape, West wasn't able to make it out of his cell in time. I'm gonna jump to the, to the conclusion. Eventually he did make it out of his cell, made it up to the roof. By the time he was there, the other three had left. So he said, I guess I'm screwed. There's no way I'm gonna survive the water. He comes back into his prison cell and decides at this point, I guess I'll just surrender the information. I'll, I'll let them know what happened. That's bad because what if they get, what if they find them, bring them back, then you surrendered all this information you're now seen as the rat. The well, you snitch. gotta hope you get a plea deal, you know? Or is he feeding real information to the guards? That's the question. Oh. Is he looking for a plea deal with some honest stuff? I mean- Or is he just trying to, you know, I don't know, just divert them away from like the true stuff? Yeah. Well, I mean, let's talk about the plan. Let's talk about what Alan West let them in on because a lot of this is provable. A lot of this, is demonstrable due to the physical evidence there in the prison. The question remains as to the plan outside of the prison. But before yeah. we continue, Christian. Yeah, I found a little bit more on Alfred. It doesn't say exactly any more details about how he was electrocuted. All I could find is that he supposedly happened days before he was eligible for parole and he was My attempting God. to escape. But uh, family members theorized that perhaps he was beaten to death by prison guards who were trying to get information on his ah, brothers from him. Got it. Because it does seem like unfortunate timing. Man. Right. And also, if you're so close to parole, you just... Why risk it? Days away, you're mm -hmm. right there. But with that said, let's talk about the plan. And again, this is coming from West. So, Alan West told the authorities that he and the other men had been working on their plan since December of 1961. So this was a long, patiently laid plan. When one of them came across some old saw blades, which inspired the idea of makeshift tools. So I'm going to pause for a second. In their cells were these little grates. Below the sink, there was this little kind of vent that led to a breezeway or a causeway that ran behind the cells. Oh, that seems... Like it could be useful for people trying to break out. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hope is that the room below it? Below it is actually their work. So that's a different photo that we're, we're talking about. But that that's kind of their workshop area that we're going to discuss. So okay. the plan was to make tools to get through that vent. The vent was about five inches tall by nine inches wide. So not really enough for a grown man to get their way through. The idea was to take things like spoons from the kitchen in order to chisel away at the plaster and at the wall to right. make this vent bigger. But another thing that they did was they devised a new tool. They created a drill powered by a vacuum cleaner motor, which enabled them to drill holes essentially around the vent where they could then weaken the wall, pull the whole thing off Jesus. the wall to create a huge hole in the wall that they could then put back. So they right. now had a door essentially that allowed them to get back into the breezeway behind it. There was a small kind of cramped mechanical like, alley behind yeah. these these cells that they could then access. It was not guarded because no one anticipated anybody being able to get in there. No, not at all. And this is where kind of everything went down. So this is where Alan West's plan kind of fell apart. He also had drilled out his vent. And again, long story short, his kept falling out. His kept becoming very obvious and he didn't want the guards to see it. And so when he kind of days before they decided to actually enact their plan, he had kind of put some cement back in there in order to hold it temporarily. But it sounds like he did too good of a job because when the night came, he couldn't get the grate off the wall. Oh. The other guys came up behind it, started kicking it from behind. It couldn't get out. Well, okay, so... So he was stuck in his room. Okay, that answers some of the questions that I had. Where it's like, yeah. okay, they were all able to get behind, like through the grate, 
but it was a whole like access way that they can all like meet up yes. and that's mm -hmm. insane which is why they wanted to be in the same cell block right let alone right next to each other and also it's like it, that makes it easy to pass the drill around or mm -hmm. whenever they need to yeah i'm sure they'd like deconstructed a vacuum or something they deconstructed a vacuum to get that motor right and then they put a little piece insane. of metal that could spin around with the motor and you'd say okay well what about all the noise well this happened during their music hour i guess every day they had some sort of happy hour music hour where they could make a bunch of noise, where oh, they could play their instruments. Man, this is like in a movie. It, and it was a movie. Clint Eastwood told me all about this. There's, oh. There is a movie about this escape. But it, uh, it was interesting. So they would drill around this vent while the music was going on. In fact, one so of these smart. guys had essentially, uh, what was it called? An accordion or a concertina, which is like one of those kind of wind instruments where you kind right. of like push in push the out. billows and the, yeah. the airflow and keys create different notes but yeah one of them had that instrument so oh it's my particularly gosh. So of course they're probably like jamming oh away yeah. they're jamming out you know they got their own little band going now damn sometimes it's i mean not easy because like you have to have the knowledge and the know-how to deconstruct a vacuum and then attach a drill head mm -hmm. on top of it etc but like hey sometimes it's it, right it's it's almost like simple in a way yeah it's it's beautifully simple so once they had drilled these holes out they could then you know pull the vent out how did they hide this from the guards well some of them used suitcases others cardboard boxes and various other belongings some of them used their instruments to just lean up against the wall right there to create an obscured thing and i mean the guards aren't walking around scrutinizing each room every day because again they're really leaning on the fact that we are a guard, but also we're surrounded by ocean. Right. They're not going to be able to escape. They're not really seeing this coming. Now, again, behind their cells sat an unguarded utility corridor, which they used to access the rooftops of their specific cells, which were still housed within the prison. We're essentially talking about an empty volume of space now that is unguarded, that is not meant to be manned. Right. Uh, but this is what created their little secret workspace where they could develop their plans they could Damn. work on tools they could build all of the things that they needed to build and they would take turns uh having somebody stay back in the cells looking for guards before you know because somebody would come through on a last bed check right, yeah. you know once the last bed check was settled they'd be like you're good start working so uh, of course they accumulated a plethora of materials through donations or stealing from various inmates in various rooms around. I mean, you could also get classes and jobs around the prison. Yeah. I think one of them worked in the barber shop, which gave them access to hair clippings. Oh, man. Uh, eventually, they they were able to grab upwards of like 50 rubber raincoats because they had standard issue raincoats for all the yeah. prisoners. They garnered 50 of them, and they actually used those to create a raft. They had access to a library as well, which they had plethora of right. literature. Yeah. A lot of this was redacted for problematic information that you wouldn't want a prisoner to know. Yep. But I think it was like, Christian, do you know the name of the, the magazine? Was it like Mechanics Digest or something of that nature? I, it's on the tip of my tongue. But while he looks that up, essentially, it was a magazine that talked about mechanics and all sorts of things. And now, there was some very niche information within these magazines that somebody redacting these wouldn't have really put two and two together, but one of them was like vulcanizing rubber and how to, to make a, a makeshift duck. And they used Whoa. that in order to take the rubber raincoats, yeah. cut them, uh, seal them by stitching and using rubber cement that had vulcanizing ingredients within the cement to create a waterproof seal so they could create a raft. That's so smart. It's and crazy. Like Oh, the, I'm losing. The, here's the thing. The I'm time way off and, the script and, right and now. I'm effort, way, oh like, yeah, I'm way off my notes. So I'm forgive me if I go back over this information. I'm just so stoked on how cool this is. Yes, I know they're prisoners, but also like would, yeah. the way they put this all together is so ingenious. It it blows my mind every time I think about it. And it was popular mechanics. Was popular the name of the mechanics. Yeah. Thank you very much. But yeah, so somebody worked in. So one would go to the library. One would work at the barber shop. All that sort of they stuff. They really like. Not only did they just MacGyver this stuff, right? Take take a little piece of this, a mm -hmm. little piece of that, and then construct something. But they they also did the research and kind of just like it's all so smart. Oh yeah. So they ended up creating a raft that was about six foot by fourteen feet, so that way it could carry safely all four men. Uh, they also made the life preservers out of the same rubber, and to seal them, not only did they have the rubber cement and the vulcanizing stuff and the stitching they used this is wild i'm just like i'm so 
like, I don't know, I, I hate to say it, I'm like proud of how clever this is. They used the steam from the pipes in this corridor, the hot pipes, to that made, basically dude, yeah. seal, finish the seal. Yep. So we could like get that vulcanizing right. process underway. You, that's how you and, like, get that heat. Oh my God. Man. It's just, it's and they so had wild. a whole damn workshop uh -huh. that was just yep. unseen. I don't think this is in my notes, but I do want to say I, I did in my research about this, and right. it could be anecdotal, so I want to admit that. Okay. But one of the things that was said, again, to put scrutiny on the guards and how low their guard was, one of the guys, I believe it was uh, Captain Brainiac, said that, hey, like he got permission essentially to hang up sheets around his like MacGyvered workshop up there because what? he's like, I'm, you know, I'm helping out the prison. This is my job around the prison. I'm just like, you know, helping keep the mechanics alive and whatnot. But okay. when I work, dust is settling down and it's making a mess. So can I just hang up some sheets to make sure that, you know, I don't, I keep that dust in and they're like, yeah, go for it. You can't escape. This is inescapable. Whoa. Well, behind those sheets, the guys would get out at night and they would actually use that as their workshop. Oh my God. God. So it was it was a combination of luck and cleverness and the guards just kind of not expecting this. Right, right. It is wild. Oh man. That's smart. Yeah. That's so smart. And the, the just sly, slick, all of it. Smooth mm -hmm. as hell. Yep. And, and uh <laughs> I almost feel like you like I get it, it takes more time and manpower. But I feel like if they just had someone do like a random walk at like 3 a.m. or something like that, they might have been able to like cure them or catch them. Or oh, something. yeah. Well, the night that they escaped, this is just a fun fact from your old pal Trey. So <laughs> the night they escaped around 1030 p.m., one of the guards did, in fact, hear them clambering about on the on the pipes. They just oh. didn't note it. They, they, well, I guess they mentally noted it, but they didn't investigate. Right. They're like, maybe it's rats or whatever. Like, yeah. why would anyone be in the pipe? Like, or... that's a strange sound. And then it stopped. And then they said, okay, moving right. on. Ooh. But coming back to their plan real quick. Um, so they made wooden paddles out of wooden scrap that they then screwed together with like whatever screws that they could find. Right. Um, they Strip also uh, took apart their concertina, that little musical instrument that looks a little bit like this. I'm showing in a picture. Oh, yeah. but, but again, it's like, Two wooden paddles with an accordion style um air like pocket between that you, you kind of move your hands in and out. That's the best I can describe it. <laughs> but they they took that apart in order to make it into a pump for the raft so they could inflate the thing because it was so big. They couldn't just breathe uh. into it. Now, amidst their manufacturing, they also tried to scout the best route up to the roof and where they should go as far as the sea route. They discovered that there was a vent on the roof that was actually quite weak. And so they climbed up a series of pipes about 13 feet or so up and they pried open one of the ventilator grates at the top. And then they held it together so that way no one would find out that it was open. They held it together with a bolt made out of soap. So that way it would hold it together what just well though? enough that when the night came, they could just bust it open. But no one would otherwise know. A bolt made out of soap? A bolt made out of soap. That's genius. Yeah. So they uh, they held so wait, the ventilator in place with that until they could make their escape. Yeah. So were they just like scoping it out night after night? So they were building, but also like yeah. scoping ahead of like, yeah. okay, we we're building this. We're gonna scope out, you know, how to get to the roof. All right, cool. Next night we're gonna scope out like the roof. Next night, all right, we're gonna scope. We're like, mm -hmm. this is our like kind of like way to get down or get around. Essentially, yeah. Okay, they little became, by little. Yeah, they became quite intimately aware Jesus. of... It. I mean, this was over the course of starting in December, uh, climaxing in June. So you got six yeah. to seven months yeah, of they this. Yeah, months. That's chipping away at the vent took several weeks to months, of course. And then finally getting the vent out, they would get up in there. You have to garner all your supplies. You have to put this yeah. all together. So while they're putting this all together, periodically people would be on lookout. They'd climb up the vents. So they had their whole physical, as far as the Alcatraz route, figured out. So in the night, while they're working away, somebody could go up to the roof, in theory, and peek out across the, the right. ocean. Of course, they wouldn't want to get seen, but that's where they would say, all right, where is the nearest landfall? What's the current looking like? Because you, you mentioned the tides. They come in and out, and that creates some pretty severe activity in the bay. Yeah. And you don't want to be swept out to sea, which no, is very likely. So that's the plan. I, again, I'm just so wildly impressed with how they were able to pull all this stuff it together. It is quite impressive because it's just, I don't know, from, from back to front, like this thing was just so planned out 
And then on, on top of everything, it's just they had complete control. They, I think, I think that's correct. I think they that's were a crazy complete thing, control. right? It wasn't like, let's just during this time, there's a guard shift and we're just going to bolt for it. They had complete control. Mm -hmm. They knew exactly what the route was, what they were doing and everything like that. Like it is insane. Oh, yeah. Now, and you feel much more comfortable if you know your surroundings and you know, like where you're going, what you're doing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, they had the huge upper hand. And now here's the thing. Like. Knowing this as a surface level, knowing this as a film, I mean, it's again, this was made into a film, movie right. podcast about mysteries. Mm -hmm. It's impressive. We're going to talk about the escape. Impressive. What blows my mind is the more I looked into the theories is it continues to get stranger. It continues to get more titillating. In fact, there was uh, facial recognition software that was being applied back in 2020. I don't want to get too much into that right now because we're going to discuss that. But like, I'm heck? just so impressed with how long this has gone on all the way up until two years ago that they were still kind of investigating new information. It gets wild. So if you thought this was the climax of the crazy, it gets interesting. Hey everybody, this is Trevor as always. Well, I guess not always anymore. We've had Christian pop in here a few times, so I hope you enjoyed getting to hear his sultry deep voice. But hey, uh, just wanted to talk to you about some uh, housekeeping news as always. I'm super, super excited. We've been talking about it for a few months now, but we got the plush, the baby hands. He's on the way. We got a little backpack coming along with him. We got a few things coming on June 9th. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the date so that way you can mark it on your calendars. It's uh, on 6-9. <laughs> nice. So uh, mark the dates because that is going to be a big launch for us and it will mean a whole lot if all of you pour out, show your support for little old baby hands. He's a caked up little ghost and he's very cute, but also has very, very tiny hands. You can find that at store.roosterteeth.com. Get yourself some, get one for your dog, get one for your kids, whoever. Maybe you want to, you can use him as a beacon to prevent ghosts from haunting your house. He's just that adorable and he has that power. But hey, maybe if the opposite happens, don't blame us. You might find little baby handprints all over your house, but just know he's a kind ghost, not a friendly ghost because that's trademarked, but he is kind and he won't. Well, I can't make any promises, but I, let's just say he's not a poltergeist. But with that said, let's talk about some of today's sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a podcast that dives into the details behind conspiracy theories, cults, and scams, or the secret worlds like the mafia or even North Korea? What about money laundering? Well, you can get that and more on The Jordan Harbinger Show. It covers a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with guests that offer an inside look at worlds most of us don't get to see, you goon. <laughs> Check out his episode on combating cult mind control or his episode with Javier Pena and Stephen Murphy on taking down Pablo Escobar. The show also covers technology stories like deep fakes, which is becoming very prevalent right now. I mean, there's even filters on TikTok that use deep fakes. It's wild. Uh, they also cover telepathy and preventing superbug epidemics, which is all very, um, let's, how do you say, very with the times. Uh, these are all very interesting topics as well. So check out jordanharbinger.com slash start if you want to get some episode recommendations or simply search The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Life can be overwhelming and many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment fatigue, and many, many more. There are a lot of symptoms to burnout and many other things. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Any of our other roles in life can lead us to feel burned out. And BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. I'm gesturing to you, Task Force, with my open hand so you know I'm not pointing at you rudely. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. You don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Task Force, you can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash redweb. Once again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Red Web. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip all those annoying trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and 
cafe affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh now has 30 dinner recipes to choose from every single week. That's the most choices of any meal kit. Discover seasonal summer recipes like cucumber salad stuffed pita pockets or chicken sausage stuffed peppers or Tuscan spice shrimp. I, I, these all sound phenomenal. I've used HelloFresh before because let me just be perfectly honest. I hate going to the grocery store, and so to have my food show up right at my doorstep and make me feel like a culinary cuisine a god, because I get to go out through the instructions are all picture-oriented, and you know me, I don't like to read, I like to look at the pictures, and it makes me feel like I'm cooking something and it's always good. So you can do that too, you can go to hellofresh.com slash redweb16, okay, R-E-D-W-E-B-1-6, you can use our code redweb16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Once again, that's 16 free meals and three free gifts by going to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16 and using code RedWeb16. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And with that said, let's get back to one of America's greatest prison escapes. So let's talk about okay. the escape. Let's, let's put our minds back. Right. June 11th, 1962. This is when they decided that their plan was ready. It was perfected and it was time to put it into action. As mentioned previously, West was unable to escape his cell in time, so unfortunately, despite all attempts and efforts, he was going to be left behind. Morris and the Anglin brothers, on the other hand, did make it into the corridor, they gathered up their gear, they climbed up and out through the ventilator, got onto the roof of the prison, and from here, they slid down the smokestack at the back of the cell house. They then jumped the fence and darted to the northeast shore of the island, where they floated off in their escape raft. After a prolonged search, the FBI officially closed the case December 31st, 1979. So 17 and a half years later, they concluded that the likelihood Jeez. of the men surviving the treacherous swim was very, very unlikely. And so they said, you know what? They just died. We probably didn't, didn't find the their water. bodies. Let's close the case. They turned it over to the U.S. Marshals Service, which continues to investigate despite the doubt that the men are even alive. And they plan to keep searching for answers until all three men pass on what would be their 99th birthdays. So they're basically saying, we're going to continue looking into this right, until, until we physically know that they can't possibly be around <laughs> yeah. anymore. Or at least very, very unlikely. Very unlikely. So this is where the story and the evidence ends. It's unsure exactly what happens next to these three men. You know, are they lost at sea? Did they drift out? Did their raft hold up? Or did it succumb to the, to right, the waters to and the, the rocks? Waters. Because we found scraps. So did they succumb to the water and drown? Who knows? Now, before moving on, I do want to say this is where things get a little bit more hairy and we have to, and we have to rely on Alan West's story. But he told the guards all this stuff about the plan. The vent, the workspace, going up through the roof, the raft, all of that. Now, he then further elucidated them as to say they went to Angel Island, which was the shortest distance. I think it was just over a mile away, so it would be a little bit easier to do. They would then cross Angel Island, uh, go catty corner up to another smaller island before leapfrogging off to the mainland, because going straight for the mainland would probably be the most difficult Yeah, it would be rough. So that's why it's interesting that the oars were found on the coast of Angel Island, that the scraps were found near... The bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge, yeah. But otherwise, we don't know exactly the route that they took. That's just what Alan is letting us in on. That's... So many things could have happened. I... I what do you think? I, I would love I to doubt, get your thought on this. I mean, uh, just, just knowing the bay and how mm -hmm. far it is and just actually seeing it yeah. growing up in that area. That, I mean, that is a... That's rough waters. Mm -hmm. Especially, like, if you're not going in during, like, um, like low tide and you didn't plan it out. Like, I just don't under, mm. like people train to swim that. Yeah, that's a whole event um, now, isn't it's, it? It's an event. Yeah. There's, this makes me feel like you and I should get hands on, get up in that cell, see if we can squeege, squeegee ourselves through. <laughs> squeegee <laughs> came out of my mouth. <laughs> squeeze ourselves through that vent, climb up those, those uh, pipes. Man, that'd be cool. Make like a raft and kick it. I you think we could I do it? I don't think that. No, hell no. We're, yeah, we're going to have to try it. I think we're going to have to no, try it. There's no way. Christian, write that down. New live action series. You got it. We're going to pitch this Prison television. Prison break. Prison break. Come in 2022. Oh, oh God. That's, this year. Yeah. Whoa. Kind of quick. We'll go tomorrow. Quite ambitious. All right. If that, it, that is listen, a task force. If this man's promises let you down, <laughs> that's, uh, you know who to come for. Him. That's that's, that's <laughs> his division. <laughs> this is ambition on top of ambition here. Um, but yeah, what, yeah, what do you think it, is likely here? I, 
I just for me, I'm they didn't make it. I don't feel like I don't feel like they didn't make it. Yeah? Yeah. I I'm kind of with you there until we get into these theories. There's more oh. information to talk about. Oh, well, let's see if you can sway me in the other oh, direction. Yeah. All right, let's talk about theory number one, that the men fell victim to the Pacific Ocean and never reached the shore. Let's see if there's any water to your theory, Fredo. That's what I believe in right now. All right, well, you're on board with the, with the FBI. So the FBI backs up this theory by pointing out to a number of reasonable explanations. Uh, because again, this is where Occam's razor comes in, which is to say the most likely answer is the real answer. So let's talk about crossing the bay. While many people have in fact completed the more than mile long swim from Alcatraz to Angel Island, the strong currents and average Pacific temperature of, oh man, that's even lower than I thought, 38.5 degrees Fahrenheit or three and a half degrees Celsius is the oh, average. Oh, oh. Those were clearly not in the favor of anybody trying to escape. Of course, they had a raft, which does right. help get them out of the water a little that's bit. Cool. Man, that's a lot of kicking. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine how your feet would just like freeze up. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, like, uh, what is that, frostbite? Entirely possible. I mean, you're pushing freezing temps there. You're not far off. However, as we like to address those wrinkles in the moment, one of the, the wrinkles here is that the possibility of surviving this is not impossible. It's quite unlikely, but it's not impossible because another inmate, John Paul Scott, did in fact escape Alcatraz later in that very same year, in December of 1962, months after that, that story released. Maybe this guy was inspired to say, I too can make it. He reached the San Francisco beach naked and suffered from hypothermia. Not frostbite, hypothermia. That's a, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but of course, he was instead quickly recaptured by the police sent back to the island. Why was he butt naked? I don't know. That, I mean, he's like, here's the thing. If you're going to swim in prison clothes that they got, which are all kind of like one size fits all, yeah. you're going to get waterlogged. It's going to be hard to swim in. Right. It's also not really going to keep you warm. Damp, heavy. Yeah. Might as well drop it. <laughs> swim with what God gave you. Butt naked. <laughs> now, according to the information that West provided, the group's plan was, again, to steal clothes and a car once they reached the shore. In 2011... A National Geographic special claimed that the FBI reported a stolen blue Chevrolet and that it later had an accident on the road. And inside that Chevy, witnesses claim were three men, but they were not confirmed to be the suspects at hand. But I don't think they were, Christian, were they confirmed to be anybody? Like maybe they were, the, the, I guess the jury is still out. Were they the three men or were they not? It does land pretty nicely into the camp of what Alan West was saying, that they were going to steal a vehicle this one was stolen, had three men in it, but we don't know if it's them. Is it that easy, though? Is it that easy? They made it. Sometimes I just want to go, man, put me back in the 60s. I'll go rob right. a bank and steal a car and kick. People are just getting away with it. I guess or they, they're not, but then they're escaping. <laughs> is, it, is it that easy? But why would the FBI keep that covered up until like this day then? Maybe it wasn't like covered up. Or he, maybe they just my best were able guess, to link him, link it together. Maybe my best guess is that it's either hindsight is twenty twenty, or it's that the FBI doesn't just release all their information because of you know privacy and everything. Yeah. But this is also the unbreakable prison. They're trying to maybe save face and keep this information close to their chest so they can figure out this case under wraps, get those men back to the prison if they were in fact alive, and then say, okay, cool. Our image is still secure. The public don't need to freak out. This prison doesn't need to shut down. Maybe that's but like what it was. shortly after someone else broke out and actually made it to the shore. But then they were captured. True, but the whole point is, can't break out of it. Right. 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 Well, I mean, regardless of being captured. Spoiler alert: It was shut down. The prison uh, yeah, yeah, no longer yeah. maintains itself as a prison, but now it's a, a tourist site. It is. I've seen it from afar many times now, on the very windy, very chilly coast. In the dead Very of summer, chilly. still. <laughs> but yeah. In fact, in 2011, there was a National Geographic special that had a couple other informational pieces that I want to talk about. So they said that a raft was found on Angel Island. They said that there were footsteps leading away from it that very next day. And on that same day that a blue Chevy truck was reported stolen. Now, the reason why I want to mention this is because 80 miles east of San Francisco, in another town in California, somebody else reported that a blue Chevy truck with three men in it had run them off the road and almost made them crash. 
And other sightings of this mysterious blue Chevy had been reported in many different states across the country. I'm talking like Oklahoma, Indiana, Ohio, and South Carolina. Christian, do we have any idea on like how these states relate to the families? Because that would be very interesting information. Not from anything that I'm seeing. Uh, just a very cursory search says that they have some family in Georgia, but that's not one of the states listed. So I don't know if it relates in any way. I think the thing that stands out to me, because like they had all been arrested and shared a place in Atlanta, a prison, I should say, not a place, like <laughs> their roommates. Right. But they had also, some of them had been arrested in Ohio. So, you know, maybe they're finding their old stomping grounds. Yeah. Maybe this Familiar isn't them. territory. Maybe sightings that are unrelated. But it's so interesting that many years later, yeah. National Geo is coming through and being like, yeah, there was a raft there with footsteps. And, How um, would they know that information? Right. So as, I'm wondering if like the FBI held that close to the chest, right? right to be like, oh, we got to protect the image of Alcatraz. Yep. We want to shut it down or whatever. But, but also like we don't want people to know that there's like people that broke out of that's prison. That's another good point. Right. And we there's can't three find dangerous them. men. Ah. And we can't find them. Because that would, I mean, that would set the nation a, a riot. Right? Like, if you knew three, like, high-level prison... I mean, I think I think for a fact, one of these men was actually named public enemy number one. Not a lot of people get that title. No. I forget which of these three men it oh, was. It doesn't matter. If one, if one of them was, then, like, yeah. to me, yeah, the FBI is like, okay, they um, escaped. Imagine they got the out. headlines. It's Imagine, the, like, yeah. yeah. So I'd be like, I'd be freaked out. Especially because right. I grew up public in Indiana. I'd be like, they're in Indiana. One escapes from unbreakable oh my God. prison Alcatraz. Oh my God. That's a that's a bad headline. You don't want to see. The streets are going to be empty for a minute Ooh. while they sort that out. Ooh. But yeah, that's right. some really now interesting kind of, information. Mm, I'm going to lead them in the other direction. Yeah. So that's that's a, a wrinkle here in the plan. You know, it's not impossible that they, that they made it. Uh, there is some other information out there. But let's come back to the theory that they didn't make it because... The family didn't seem to know anything about this uh, when they were interviewed, and or should I say interrogated, they didn't really seem to know the whereabouts, they weren't contacted, etc. And for the 17 years that the FBI worked on the case, it seemed that no credible evidence that supported the idea that the men were still alive ever came forward. So they felt very confident in stating, and when they closed the case, that these men didn't make it. And that's why they closed the case. I mean, I would just lay low for the rest of my life. Yeah. Right. I, I like, mean, of course. You right? are highly sought after and they will have their eyes on you for many years. I yeah. would just lay low and I'm just living a hole somewhere. Yep. So ultimately, it seemed that many of their tools were found. Many of the scraps of the materials, the life vests, the paddles, the rafts, etc. They, they were all found. And the fact that they, their physical selves, weren't found. I mean, it's a very divisive fact, but a lot of people seem to indicate that that means that they were lost to the sea. But... I don't know. If they were kicking it, they wouldn't just be like, I've got the raft as a collectible, you know? I mean, that's the thing that's so difficult is the fact that um, you have no idea if they made it and right and it washed up uh, like it was on the shore because they made it or they didn't make it and it just the materials just washed up onto mm -hmm. the shore. Yeah. What if I they just decided to prank wait, the guards and they think, start throwing things out at sea yeah. every night? They're just like... Little letters that say, I escaped. My exactly. name is so and so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if they drowned, their bodies would most likely float and then out to sea, though. Probably. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could probably. be out to sea as opposed to like getting nibbled washing up. up on shore. And, oh, man. That's the, the cool thing. The cool thing is that like we pretty much have their whole escape route and plan and tool cemented. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yep. It, like, instead of that, that's not really heavily, like, theorized. That's, like, we have the actual route, the evidence, the materials. Yeah. Like, someone who was a part of the escape plan wasn't able to make it out. So, it's cool that that whole plan is completely, like, in my mind, it's meant to... It's known. It's yeah. known. That's how it happened. Yeah. I, I tend to believe Alan West's story. I think, you know, he was my maybe striking for a plea deal and also a little bent out of shape he couldn't get out. And um, so I think, you know, at least 90% of his story holds. We know the inside game. The outside game is still maybe up for grabs. But let's I'd talk also, about... I, I mean, ahead. I'd also like to think that years and years later, you right at that point, you just go, okay, this is what really happened. Right. Or or just... I got no reason to hold it anymore. Right. Well, then what's the reason to hold it? Um, You know, you're like, if they made it, I'm sure they're fine now. Yeah. So I could say it. Here's some Whatever. information. 
et cetera. Yeah. Or I don't know. Or maybe, oh, what if he was like sent a letter or something? Do you <gasps> think they were like monitoring that? And then like maybe he got sent a it letter that sign, they made it. Your buddy Green. Right. You know, they like made it and he's just like, all, all right, just I'm not going like, to say anything. Yeah. It says, Dear West, all is green, sky blue. Thumbs up emoji. Signed your buddy, <laughs> Mr. Green. Yep. Right? Thumbs like, who's Mr. Emoji. Green? What does this thumbs up emoji <laughs> mean? What does this mean? <laughs> what is this? Where's the cipher? Um, <laughs> I, it just, it, it, he holds just up a, his hand with a thumbs up. Right. It's just that, officer. <laughs> oh, man. That's our minds running wild. Yeah. That, that's, that'd be nuts. Well, let's drop some bombshells here because let's talk about the other theory that the idea that the men made it, that they survived, that they just left all their effects behind them. They copped a ride and got out of there. There's a couple different theories that lie within this theory, a lot of other pieces of information that we're going to try to address. But nearly 50 years later, and this is really what brings this theory to light strongly, the Anglin family provided evidence that the men might have actually survived. The Anglin's mother claimed that she received Christmas cards signed with their names dating up to three years after the escape. It seems like a problematic thing to do. Maybe it was a prank, but it seems like the police would be able to kind of get in on that and be like, Mama Anglin, what's going on here? Where is this coming from? What's the return address? Did this, was this proven to have happened or is this more just like... That's a good question. Right. Because it is a story, but Christian, do we have evidence that these postcards were real or was it the mother kind of... Right. But why would she spin a tale? Like, you know, especially if her sons broke out of prison and were alive well, we don't elsewhere. Know the, the relationship. Oh, that's Maybe a good point. Maybe he doesn't like her sons. She's ashamed of what they've done. Maybe. I mean, all assumption, but, you know, there could be a rift within the family dynamic. And then from there, that's why she's like, hey, I got this postcard. That's but very I, possible. I, I do feel like if there was a postcard, that that should be evidence that's, like, pretty locked in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, there was word of a postcard was there or was there not it's a, it's a postcard right. right yeah 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 that's that i mean that's true that and that's just like but, the nuance of my notes that like no but i mean not. but the thing is like it's so many years ago oh, yeah. and we don't know like a number of things could have happened little like details and changes and yeah you know, years and years have gone by well christian's still looking that up i'm very curious because that's a very good question but while he looks that up, there's another piece of information that stems from 2020 that I'm very eager to talk about. So I believe it's pronounced David Widener, W-I-D-N-E-R. He was a nephew of the Anglin brothers and claimed that his family had been given some photos taken by a man named Fred Breezy. So Breezy was a friend of the Anglins and claimed that the men survived their escape and then fled to Brazil. He gave Widener a photo of the two men wearing sunglasses that he claimed were John and Clarence Anglin, the two men, the two brothers of the three that escaped. I'm going to show you this photo now because it's wild. I've never seen this photo before. So these are the two men standing on what looks like farm grounds. It looks like they're stood near a rock or something yeah, like, like a little that. little dirt mound and yeah. next to a road, kind of wilderness-esque. I mean... Is, I mean, is that them? It's hard to say because it is an older photo. Uh, it, it, and their hair is longer. They got the sunglasses right. on. They have facial hair. Yeah, I so mean, there's the facial hair that can help mask. But as much as like it's an older photo, it's a lot clearer. Than, that's the that's uh, the magic like of film. I'm, versus uh, we grew up with digital before it was ready. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the thing though. It's a lot clearer than I thought it'd be. Yeah. So what's interesting here is that. Facial recognition experts that year asserted that Breezy was in fact telling the truth, that these two men, as they appeared in this photo, were in fact the two convicts that had escaped. So we got facial recognition experts looking at this photo. Again, I'm not a facial expert or whatever, but I look at these photos and I look at their their younger photos, uh, their prison. Yeah. Kind of, what is that? They're, when they're ingested into the system, they take their little um, headshots. Their little uh, like wanted cards or whatever. I forgot what that's called. There's a name for it. Yeah, mugshot. Mugshot. Uh, yeah, got to put that on a mug. But um, yeah, I mean, like when you look at the two photos, you're like, I can see some resemblance, like, especially the hair color. I can see a little bit of the face in the mouth and nose area, but it's it's kind of tough. It's to me to say that it's factually them. But hey, we got experts saying it is. I mean, that's about. Uh, that, that's the uh, thing I was gonna. Harp on was the fact that these are facial recognition experts. Yeah. 
they're, they're said to have gone to Brazil and, uh, and they're stood here on their farmland because that was kind of how they made a living and they just kind of lived out their days. But Christian, what do you think? What, do, what about those, uh, those postcards? I'm not finding any additional information on their existence or anything like that. All, it's, all I'm seeing beyond what's in the outline is that there was one specifically rumored to have been in the winter of 1962, which is the year they escaped. Got it. That's all Got I'm it. finding. Well, I'm going to go ahead and give this the official task force stamp of disapproval because <laughs> if these things existed uh, with all the other photos that we have here i would have i would have gathered that these would have showed up in some way that's what i'm saying why wasn't it but this obtained? photo didn't show up until 2020 why why wasn't it obtained and put in an fbi ziploc bag right. slide that thing into a manila folder inside of a ziploc inside mm -hmm. of a locker somewhere exactly right and then take that key mm -hmm. swallow it and then throw that person away. Yep. Lose them. Wow. Put them in Alcatraz and then lose them. Yep. <laughs> Solitary <laughs> confinement. I don't know. I don't know, officer. The guy that swallowed the key escaped. <laughs> Good, luck. <laughs> Good luck getting that evidence. Yeah, and then this photo just popped up. Like, I mean, were they, were they just holding on to it? So then that way they wouldn't get caught and sought after? Oh, yeah. So this photo, I guess, was uh, passed down within the family until someone far enough away, and I guess it was just a nephew when he was older, assuming that now his uncles would have either passed or that they would, you know, be in their older age, uh, probably then came out to say, hey, I got some information. Who knows? When you got the news involved and you get notoriety out of something, people might be searching for their 15 minutes. But either way, this photo came to pass and experts are saying it's them. And uh, I think it's very interesting. Widener also claimed to a local news source that, quote, we know the brothers escaped to live in South America. I know of times that they came to America to visit the family. There is no doubt in my mind they escaped from the prison and lived out their lives. So he's saying they even came back. Say hello, mamas. I mean, at that point, right, you probably got a new identity. You've been living in Brazil. Right. They're not going to catch you coming You're just in. flaunting it. You know, you're just saying, you're just flexing on the TSA and saying, FBI, like I've been in and out. But like what like it's not like if they have some some type of like fraudulent identity, right? How is how is the TSA gonna catch them? They're not being scanned. Uh, obviously there's like a True. a list, but do you think their TSA is checking every face with the list to see? Like no, they're probably just scan and go, scan and go. Yeah. Well, when it comes back to this photo and its its authenticity. Uh, we kind of can cast our shadows of doubt, but another kind of interesting piece of information on that was uh, an Irish creative agency, Rothko, actually partnered with AI specialists to create an identity test to scan photos of the men as they were known in the past, as well as this photo as they supposedly exist in that, well, present at the time, to create essentially a digital fingerprint of these photos to say, all right, Let's once and for all, instead of just using our judgment, let's create a digital fingerprint, compare them. And this test came back with a 99% positive rating that said that these were in fact the men that had escaped from Alcatraz. Look. Go for it. Hit me with it. Going into the theories, mm -hmm. I didn't think that these men made it. Okay. Now you're throwing out a photo. Mm -hmm. That's that tangibility you like. And I like it. I believe they made it. Oh, that you, quick. You, I got so much more information. Me. But the thing is, like, even, I don't know. I, I, like, I'm banking on the odds of what are the chances yeah. that even if this was a fake photo, what are the chances that they found a photo of two people that closely resemble, right, both of them? Those are the brothers, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, their their hair color is different like their heights different like what are the chances that you found a photo that was so clearly identical yeah that's a good point like that's that's the thing there it's just like that's difficult to do yeah all in itself so i don't i don't know i just don't see it being something that's like oh i just stumbled across this let's use this as a photo to like say that our, our uncles that's so like far-fetched oh me. yeah that again coming back to the idea of occam's razor that just you have to go through so many extra hoops just to make right. the the and emotions and thought process and yeah. like motives and it's just so many i don't know like that path is so convoluted to me mm -hmm. and i just don't see it just being like okay hey look at this photo it looks just like them let's go ahead and just like 
shake up the story a bit, bring it back to light, et cetera, et cetera. And also like how the hell they have found that. I don't know. Like it's, it's hard to, it's hard to pitch it in my mind as a, this is just a random fake photo. Right. Like we, it's a real photo. The motive and the it why. It just like, looks just like them. Like, yeah. It's, it's wild. But another piece of information actually came to light beyond just that photo. So the San Francisco police, as recently as 2013, received a letter from somebody who claimed that they were John Anglin. The letter read, quote, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June of 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. End quote. So the FBI officials performed a handwriting analysis against this letter, and it came back inconclusive. It is doubted that the letter is real and was probably a prank by somebody familiar with the story, but the family took it seriously. They thought that their long-lost family member was out there looking for help, and I believe that this, this story kind of, it's not here in my notes, so forgive me for, I'm again, going off memory, but that story continues to unfold saying that I will come forward and admit guilt that it was me as long as you only give me a, a year in prison so I can get help, so I can get medical help for my cancer because if he is who he is, he doesn't want to go to the hospital and get found out. Yeah. Um, and well, at least that's how that story kind of continues. And, but that's where it ends. The FBI never really publicly addressed this letter. Um, the police never really said anything about it outside of it coming to light. And so who knows what happened behind the scenes. Um, but otherwise most people think that this was just kind of ignored. Damn. Yeah. I mean, it, that's what I was saying. Like we've, we've said it multiple times, like if you got away with it, you get to a certain age, you just go, eh, whatever. I live my life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're 83 and not doing too well, you right? Know, you might just be like, you know what? I'd like to live a little more. Maybe I can get some help at a medical facility, but Damn, whatever. This yeah. is juicy. Very juicy. So kind of continuing on with the theory that they made it, there's a couple other odds and ends I want to address. Okay. So the Anglin parents themselves believe that members of the mob or at least other gangsters may have aided the men's escape. The only wrinkle I have before I proceed further is that how would people outside of the prison know that they were trying to escape unless there were letters written and none of those letters would have come forward? It's not really easy to communicate outwardly from such a prison. Um, but it was said that a white boat was seen on the waters that night, and that's really what kind of fueled this particular sub-theory. I mean, Bay Area is a busy place. It, it is a be, busy place. It be any, any boat. Mm-hmm. Could be any. But kind of coming back to the family's theory, they believed that Mickey Cohen, Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson, and Whitey Bulger might have arranged for a boat to be waiting for the men once they reached the shore. The family continued to say that uh, the motivation behind the mob helping them was that if they could help one group get out of Alcatraz, then they could continue this trend and help others get out of Alcatraz subsequently getting out more and more people that were closer to their particular group or what have you. But it's about, so wait, they got onto the shore and then helped them with a the boat? It, that's what they were saying. I, um, I would imagine that they would kind of maybe help their raft along or maybe right. help them with a vehicle because they would definitely need a vehicle once they were on the shore or at least dry clothes and all that sort of good stuff. But yeah, that's what the family was saying. Oh man, I just don't, that, that's just a weird thing. To just be like, okay, we'll help you out. And then from there, that's we'll use that as a base to help other people. I don't know. Like, Yeah, the details are a little hairy to me. But what is interesting mm -hmm. with regards to this particular sub theory is that the mob members actually wrote the Anglins from time to time, thanking their sons for getting Alcatraz shut down. We briefly touched on it, but the fact that these three may or may not have gotten out alive doesn't matter. They got out. Somebody in December got out and got recaptured, but again, they got out. So the point was that they showed that this was not an unbreakable prison, that people could escape, and it is what fed into... Christian, what year did Alcatraz get shut down? Because this was truly part of the wave that really got this place shut down, and the mob is like, great, thanks! We no longer have to worry about this extra problematic right. prison. 1963. 1963, so it's after. even closer to this... Than I than I remembered. I thought it was later, but uh, yeah, right on the heels of these two escapes in '62. They wrote to the family. That's 
So the same question: Do we have those letters? Do we have the letters? I'm already looking. <laughs> I know you're looking. I know you're so, looking. But like, but do like, we have them? Why would they write to the family? Well, like, you know, maybe just to to flaunt their. I mean, because here's the thing: the mob is like, whatever. The FBI can read these letters. It doesn't matter. And it also doesn't say whether the sons lived or died. It's just to say, hey, thanks. But also, like, but you're, you're right. You're coming up to the family, like maybe who are in grief, and you're like, hey, thanks. I just. <laughs> Wouldn't the FBI chase that down, ask questions? So oh, to so openly just be like, hey, think. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's that's another reason why a mystery like this is not really a full mystery. It's just the outcome. What happened to these three men is really the, the I mean, mystery that's, within that's a mystery the story. In itself, yeah, for sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the fact that we don't have these supposed letters and postcards that that kind of yeah. feed into that. But that's just the nature of mysteries, right? Is True. The, the hearsay. Yep. You'd be lucky if you get anything that's like concrete. Yeah. I feel like every episode I have to like be like, well, that's why it's a mystery. But I mean, like, it is what it is. I just like, I just hate not what, having answers what, sometimes. It wouldn't be a mystery if we knew the answer. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, and that's why we're talking about it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think I flipped over to the other side. I think that they did make it. Yeah. Um, The facial recognition. Uh, I mean the postcards or something all on its all on its own, but I think the, I think the picture itself. I think it's hard for me to think of them just faking that. Yeah. Well, as Christian kind of wraps up his like his little research there, the letters themselves have yet to be validated due to the lack of response from Bulger's attorney. So the question has been put out as to the validity of these letters, but we just don't know. Yeah, just like the postcards, there's no photographic proof or evidence that these letters exist. The family claims to own them and is claims to have shown them to journalists and whatnot. And they are all supposedly postmarked with a return address of a federal prison in Florida. But there's no... Okay, so, okay. So there's a lot to unpack there because I could just leave it as is and move on with my life. But that implies two things. One, that they've got a lot of good juicy details that they've given to journalists whose entire job is predicated on exposing stuff and talking yeah. about stuff. Mm -hmm. None of that happened. Secondly, they these men have been ingested, re-ingested into the prison system in Florida and no one knows? Oh, this is getting goofy. Getting goofy. It's a little messy. Well, the last thing I want to say is kind of coming back to that boat that I was spitballing about because it okay. was an SF police officer that said that they saw a boat in the ocean or in the bay rather. All right, all right. So that night had no lights on, which is inordinary. Yeah, that's not... Unordin not ordinary. It's not ordinary. <laughs> but the only light that they saw on the boat was a flashlight scanning the water as if looking for people that were out there. And that's why the police officer came forward with that information. But other police officers were never able to find such a boat uh, no boat was ever proven to have existed. And so who's to say if that boat was ever there or a part of this mystery at all? Damn. I mean, just put a brick on the gas pedal of the boat and just let that baby rip into the sea or the open sea. I will say, I think uh, boats don't have pedals. I think you just push a little. I've seen Titanic a couple oh, yeah, times. I so about, I think they just do. As they I call was, out and they say, full steam ahead. And then some poor lad has to go. Pull ring, a, ring. Yep. And then a, a lever gets locked in. In my head, I admit. Uh, yes. As I was saying, pedal, I was like, do both have a... It's more just like a lever. Yeah. Um, no, I, I like the the visual, though. Of like... Yeah. A little pedal. I would like a pedal on a boat. Like, maybe at least like a... No, oh, no, jet ski, just rip it like a motorcycle. That yeah. That makes more sense. Imagine you're hitting the waves, but like as you're... Poof, 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 as you're I mean, hitting the bottom of the wave, your baby. foot slamming on the pedal going... <laughs> ring, ring. Yeah. Just sink it. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if a police... Oh, God. So you know, you can mean this, a little bit of that. And Where's your mind at? Let's, let's consolidate here at the end. What? What, oh, the letters are, are hard to believe. It's mm -hmm. just like, it's just on the cusp of like believable. But, the, yeah. you know, at the same time, it's like, why well, having the journalists, like, they're so open about showing these letters and having it be publicly... um Having it be public information. It's like, why wouldn't we just get the photographic pieces of that? puzzle um then with the boat that didn't quite add up didn't quite make sense but you have a police officer so that's someone that's credible reporting that like lights are off so with the flashlight looking around but then why didn't they 
report it or if they were a police that was on like boat patrol why didn't they go up and say hey turn on your lights right i just a lot of extra questions with yeah. some of these open-ended statements yeah there's just there's a lot of just questions there but i can see them just going ah, i saw that and i went whatever not my problem yeah you know like yep. well that ends uh the escape from alcatraz pretty much known as the greatest escape ever devised within a prison especially given those th- the circumstances I, I mean i can see um, why I yeah mean, they had full damn control of the facility oh yeah that was awesome they run that sense. place now but as christian mentioned this place was shut down only one year later if if even that and the rest of this the, the fate of the men are kind of still up in the air I'm, i'd be very curious to see in the subsequent years following this episode's release if uh if these letters don't come out at some point because it took until 2020, almost 60 years later, for this photo to come out. So I'll be interested to see if there are things floating around the family as like heirlooms right. or whatever. Like, like, why not? Will they expose it? Especially when the age of each man is, is meant to reach 99 and the official full right. investigation shuts down broadly. Most will they finally likely come through? they're still not alive. Yeah. It's like Beyblade, baby let her rip. Man, throw I'm, that evidence out. I'm so interested. I, I really want to know. But anyway, this has been the Escape from Alcatraz. I'm so happy we covered this one because, like, it's I've, I've one. loved this mystery ever since I saw that. What I think it's a '79 film or the With, '70s. Uh, Clint Eastwood. With Clint Eastwood has a photo too. Has Frank it's, Morris. Based all blown um, up on the cover. But yeah, all right. Well, Damn. I think they. I think they I got think they out. Got away. I think I they think were out away. there. You're, you changed me. You changed. I don't my know mind. what happened to Frank Morris. But at least the England brothers were down there kicking it in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, I'm storm. sure he just went his own way. Yeah. All right. Well, Fredo, I'll see you right back here for yet another mystery next Monday. <laughs>